everybody. Um, welcome to Munching on Human Rights, Human Rights 101. My name is Krista Elliott, and I am a member of the Student Advisory Board for the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, and also the social media editor for the Human Rights Brief. So before we, we get started with your program today, I just wanted to let you know some of the wonderful opportunities and events that are coming up through the center. Um, first, we have coming up uh, on Thursday the 12th, an event called Accountability, Transitional Justice, and the Case of Northern Ireland. This is going to take place at noon in room 100, and it'll be a really in engaging discussion of the challenges um, for accountability in transitional post-conflict contexts with a focus on Northern Ireland. A WCL professor, Diane Orent Licker, who is a former UN independent expert on combating impunity, will be one of the speakers, along with Peter Kissel, the human rights chair of the Irish American Unity Conference, and Niall Murphy, the a partner with the Belfast solicitors, Kevin R. Winters and Company. And lunch will be served at that. So anybody who wants some, some more really delicious free food, please come. Um, we will then, on Friday, have a new initiative that the Center and the Student Advisory Board have started with, called Human Rights Coffee Hour. This will take place, again, on Friday the 13th from 10.30 in the morning until noon in room 524. And we're kind of trying to do this every other week. We'll alternate between being here at the law school and up on main campus. Um, they will have a different theme discussion every week, every other week, and this particular discussion will center on the right to protect and Syria. Uh, the discussion will be led by Professor Abi Mershad, who's the Deputy, Deputy Executive Secretary for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And again, there will be food and coffee, and you'll get to meet great people. Um, the week after that, on Friday, September 20th, we have the Holocaust Museum site visit, which will be, take place from 12.30 until 4.30 p.m. You'll get to meet with Holocaust survivors, tour the permanent exhibit, and then visit with a representative of the Museum's Committee on Conscience, which works to prevent genocide around the world today. Um, another, and then again, another event is a lot going on this fall, um, the Human Rights Film Series, which takes place in October. There will be a really wonderful film every Thursday in October at 5.30 p.m. in the Katzen Arts Center. Um, and it's, this is through a partnership between the center and the American University Center for Media and Social Impact. Um, the four sh movies that will be shown in the month of October are Dirty Wars, Valentine Road, Gideon's Army, and The Act of Killing. Um, so, and again, all of these events are on the website, so please go and check them out there. Finally, um, the event that I really want to kind of plug for all of you is a new event this year uh, that the Student Advisory Board has, has created called Human Rights Boot Camp. This event will combine the Holocaust Museum site visit with an experiential learning opportunity. So it'll be a two-day event from Friday the 20th through Saturday the 21st. It's a crash course in human rights. Um, you'll learn about human rights opportunities at WCL and meet with alumni working in the field. So it's a wonderful networking opportunity for everybody. Um, so again, it is the two-day event, so the Holocaust Museum and this event. And the Saturday portion will take place from 9 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. Um, and you can get to a registration form via the center's website. It's very easy, very quick, but space is limited, so please sign up as soon as you can to make sure you get the space. There will be so much food. There is pizza? No, no pizza. So for everybody who's completely sick of pizza by now, no pizza. <laughs> We've made sure of that. So, now that I have gone through all of the events, um, I want to introduce Hadar Harris, Pro Professor Hadar Harris, who will be giving your, speak, your um, talk today. Uh, Professor Harris is an international human rights attorney who specializes in issues of civil and political rights, gender equality, and domestic implementation of international norms. She's been the executive director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law since 2002 and has worked extensively in assessing and reviewing national compliance with international human rights treaties, working both with NGOs and governmental bodies and advising on implementation um, of recommendations. She has assisted in, also assisted in developing shadow reports, government reports, uh, of, or trained government and civil society representatives on a variety of treaties in various parts of the world. She is a wonderful asset both to the law school and a wonderful resource for all of you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Hadar Harris. So I just said to Krista, nobody ever introduces me. Um, you know, and nobody calls me Professor Hadar Harris except for like that first week of classes. So anyway, 
Thank you, Krista, for making the announcements, and thanks to all of you for being patient for the pizza. It looks like you've demolished it pretty well. Um, uh, and welcome to our first Munching on Human Rights. Um, we're happy to see you all here. Just a couple things. As Krista went through the various events that are coming up in the next few days, there are flyers and materials outside about them. Human Rights Boot Camp, if you like munching on human rights, geez, we got boot camp for you. Um, not only is it a networking opportunity, but really it's meant to be a more thorough exploration and actually interactive opportunity for um, people who really want to learn more about human rights to engage early on in your legal career um, around a more, a more experience. I will give you, there's going to be Jeopardy played. That's all I can say. There's going to be Jeopardy played. Um, so, so with that alone, you should want to sign up for it. In any event, it is good to have you all here. Um, we played the, uh, and I also want to thank Mike Bainey, who's our new program coordinator, standing up there in the, in the, he's the only person at the center who will be wearing a tie consistently. Um, but for his help in putting today's event on, and Melissa Delaguila, who is unfortunately gluten free, but still picking off the top of the fruit of the, uh, uh, pizza, um, for her assistance today as well. And Andrea. Um, our Dean's Fellow and Photographer, bar none. Um, because these kinds of things are always uh, group efforts and really take a lot um, of work together. So what are we doing here? And what is our plan for the next um, about 45 minutes or so? I realize that some of you may need to go to class. That's fine. Um, or you might get bored. That's not so fine, but we'll see what we can do about that um, to keep you engaged. So here's what we're going to do. Some of you know me and some of you don't know me well, but all of you are going to learn really quickly that standing behind a podium is not my favorite thing to do. And when we talk about Human Rights 101 in a crash course, over lunch, when you're tired, or when I'm tired, it's better to be Oprah Winfrey. It's a bit more engaging to have an interactive discussion. Our time is short since we started about half an hour late, minus the eight minutes of the film. Um, but those little clothespin guys that you just watched in that little eight minute film, I think give you a really good, can you hear me? Because it doesn't sound like it's, you hear me because I'm yelling at you, but do you? <laughs> Do you hear me through the microphone? No. Yes? No? Kinda? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to switch up the microphones to see. This is also a secret in this room. The, mi uh, uh, uh. the microphones rarely work. Um, so, so, our little clothespin guys um, and, and ladies um, actually really give a great eight minute crash course, like super crash course, that is far too dense for you to really get the idea of, but we will provide a link to on the center's website if you want to go back, because it really gives you a really succinct overview of some of these core issues of human rights. But so I'm going to try and do it in 45 minutes instead of eight minutes, and then we'll do it in six hours on, sa on Saturday the 20th, and then you'll spend semesters and a lifetime dealing with human rights issues. So we're breaking you in you know, piece by piece through this process. So human rights, uh, a crash course, let's start before the beginning, which a lot of times in law school we don't really do. I'm going to ask you guys to participate, and you're going to yell out, OK? What is law? How does it relate to rights? Where does it all come from? Give me some ideas. Why do we have law? Some of you, I bet, like me, were political science majors in undergrad. For some of you, that wasn't very long ago. For me, it was really a long time ago. It feels like a really long time ago. So what is law? Why do we have law? Where does it come from? You moved your elbow. <laughs> Tell me. You, there are three questions there. They're very broad. You can take it any way you want to. Okay, so law can be a framing, a, a frame for action or inaction or political action 
or can set standards around what human rights issues are. How was that for reframing what you said? Good. Hammurabi's Code. What is Hammurabi's Code? That was the first stone of rules that gave order to people, and it dates back to ancient times. Ancient times. <laughs> ancient times, right? So it's really old. The Code of Hammurabi. Right? A, a, an attempt to really create these framing principles for how society works. Right? Lots of times that's how we define law. What is law? How does it relate to rights? Somebody on this side, my jalapeno friend, got any ideas? What's your name? Jack. Jack and I are jalapeno buddies. No good burritos here as a San Francisco, and I want to just let you know. No problem. <laughs> We make it relate to rights, right? So some laws may not have anything to do with rights, but somehow, sometimes, we read them in. We, yeah, go ahead. Right, so sometimes we talk about rights as rights and responsibilities. Perfect segue, thank you. We're going we're gonna to come back to that in a bit. Uh-oh. Okay. So when we talk about law, I guess I was so excited about having a swoosh on the screen, I didn't look at the order of the slides, but we'll go with it. Um, there are different kinds of laws. Sometimes we talk about vertical law, sometimes we talk about horizontal law. Vertical law is what it sounds like. The Congress, the elected representatives of people, make laws signed by the president, implemented on the ground, from up to down. Sometimes the grassroots will suggest laws. They're approved from the legislature, signed by the executive, and they are implemented on the ground. That's vertical, horizontal law, and that's most domestic legislation is passed that way, right? Even if, you're, even if you don't have a legislature in other countries, <laughs> or maybe some would argue this one. Um, uh, international law, though, is based on a concept of equal sovereignty among states. Okay? It's therefore voluntarily adopted. Right? Nobody is telling you from the top down that you need to subscribe to international law. It's all voluntary, and it's based on the idea that all states are equal in sovereignty. The political overlay to that is different. Maybe we'll have time to talk about that, or maybe not. Um, but that's to, to we're going to like throw little tidbits out at you for things that you want to explore later. Usually, why do states actually engage and want to adopt international law? Right, it's so good that you're, that, like I wanted to see who was reading the slide. So a benefit, and you rephrased it well, um, that there's a benefit, there's an enlightened self-interest, right? It's good for me. It's good for me to adopt international law. It might be because it's good for me for my trade policies. It might be because it makes me look good on the international stage. It may be because I get to join the international stage if I ratify a treaty or I sit at the United Nations, right? And so there's a sense that um, uh, states want to participate in, in uh, uh, the international legal regimes because it's good for them in some ways, right? So international law has evolved over time. It started off with this idea that it was a state-to-state -state relationship. The billiard ball approach to international relations States were all equal, they hit each other, they bounced off, nobody looked inside the billiard ball, um, and they just related to each other in terms of treaty negotiations, what was going on outside, largely trade, piracy, those kinds of things, right, in kind of the first phase of international law. Then came this whole crazy enlightenment movement and social movements that say, wow, individuals actually have rights, right? What documents do you know? that actually say that individuals have rights. We'll go forward from the Code of Hammurabi. 
18th century. I'm going to give you some hints. Dude, come on. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Come on. Okay, we got the Declaration of Independence. We've got the Constitution of the United States. We've got the Constitution of Latvia. We've got the French Revolution. We've got all kinds of things that were going on. The Prussian Constitution. I say that not because I've read the Prussian, Prussian Constitution, but because I really want you guys to think that I have. And as a good academic, I would throw that out there for you. Um, so there were lots in the 18th century that moved forward to movements, social movements in the 1800s that would work towards the abolition of slavery, the workers' rights, right, women's suffrage. And those were movements and social movements that really articulated um, visions of human rights and visions of international law that went inside of the state. It wasn't a billiard ball anymore. It was interfering in the internal affairs of other countries, which is the critique that often has been uh, the anti-human rights critique. These days, we talk a lot about the non-state actor and how the non-state actor's actions relate to what happens to individuals and how international law can or could actually govern. It's a shift, right? Because we're not talking anymore about the state's relationship to other states or to individuals within its borders or where it's extraterritorially applied, but instead non-state actors. What is a non-state actor? Say it slowly so you can think about it. A non-state actor would be not the state. So it's an example of not the state. Yeah, lobbyists. Oh, lobbyists. OK, so an NGO, let's say. I'm going to reframe. Um, so it could be civil society being a non-state actor, OK? We hope that civil society is on the good guy's side, right, a lot of the time. We got, yeah. Say it again. Two idiots, so it's really judgmental. But it could be anybody, right? It could be somebody who is creating some sort of insurgency or insurrection. Could be what many people call terrorist groups. Could be what many people call a corporation, right? I'm not going to say how any of those definitions fall in line with what your professor said, but there are lots of entities within society that hold tremendous influence over how individual rights are affected. And more and more over time, and this was crystallized by 9-11, and the focus, at least in the West and certainly in this country, on Al-Qaeda and other uh, um, uh, groups like them, um, about how those groups, um, and, and actually even more so around the Taliban, who, right, don't at this point govern Afghanistan and yet are very powerful non-state actors within the border of Afghanistan who govern some parts but aren't making up the state, how they relate to individuals and how they would relate to rights. International law is trying to find a way to obligate non-state actors and to have them voluntarily assume obligations to be protective of rights of individuals it's a very much a work in progress. So what are we talking about? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this because we talked a little bit about it. But, but, well, let me take it back for a second. There is an intrinsic interplay, and I've hinted at it, between law and politics. The very fact that states assume international legal obligations because it's good for them means that there's a domestic political agenda there. Right? So there's an intrinsic interplay, but when we talk about international law and we talk about international human rights law, we do try to distill certain kinds of norms. Because as we talk about human rights, what are human rights? Uh-oh. There. I'm not sure where where it connects to. I just keep pointing in that direction and somehow it's going to know to change it. So what are human rights? Who can define what human rights are to me? You know that the next slide tells you, but 
or at least gives you one definition, how do you understand human rights? Human rights are, uh, based, are not based off of who you are, just that you are a human, not where you come from, and it's what each person was born with, a right. Okay. So what each person is born to, because what human rights are, I think it's inside this thing, human rights are rights that every person has by virtue of being a human being, right? So you get them, like you're not a starfish, you're lucky. Although, then you could regrow an arm. But, <laughs> sorry, I have two small children who really like starfish. Um, they are rights that every person has by virtue of being a human being. Examples of rights. I, I'm looking at the time. Give me some examples of rights. Throw them out. Just yell them out. Right to education. Great. Health. Freedom from violence. Very large category, okay. Or let me twist it, the right to security a person. Okay, go ahead. Others. Environment. What? Environment. Clean environment to a clean and healthy environment. Speech or expression or ideas. Freedom of movement, great. So some of these rights that you have outlined are rights that are well established in documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we're gonna talk about some of them like the right to a healthy environment, are evolving. We like to say that all human rights law is evolving over time, but these are some more examples, and I also wanted to regale you with the fact that I could put pictures into my PowerPoint slides. Um, freedom of thought, conscience, and relevant. In my favorite right, everyone has the right to rest and leisure, right? And when you think about it, we flippantly say that, but it's true, right? For those people working in factories, it is, you know, or for law students studying really hard, there is a right to rest and leisure, to clear one's head, and to be healthy. The basic idea is encapsulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 1, which if you don't have a copy of it, we like to circulate them. They're out on the desk in front. You should take, you should put in your wallet, put in your purse, put in your briefcase. It's useful to have. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That's really the essence of the whole operation of what human rights tries to enhance and promote. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. If we think about that for a second. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. If, if our legal system, if our political entities were to actually make that real, our world would look very, very different. So this first opening article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is really the basis for everything that comes afterwards as we talk about human rights and what they are. There are different kinds of rights and different categories of rights. And you can spend an entire semester talking about these different categories. We're just going to touch on a couple right now. Positive rights, negative rights. Give me an example. Positive rights. Right to liberty. Right to liberty. Great, thank you. Another one. Right to education. Here, I'm giving you a little hint. Okay, give me a negative right. Freedom from unlawful search and seizure. Right. Another one? Freedom from forced labor. Great. We often talk about the right to do something and the freedom from something. So positive rights and negative rights. Um, one thing, though, that is very important is whatever categorization of rights you have, all rights relate to each other and all are indivisible. So let's take, for example, the right to education that somebody mentioned before. Right? There are a bunch of spokes that come out of the wheel of the right to education. 
The right to equality and non-discrimination. Why do you need to have that in order to have the right to education? Exactly. Separate but equal? Come on, right? Boys and girls, segregation of anything, right? No good. You need to have the right to equality and non-discrimination. Everybody needs to be able to have the same access to the same kinds of resources. The right to food. Why do you need the right to food? We are big believers in that around here, in this educational institution. Why do you need the right to food? Well, you can be educated if you don't know. Try again. When you're focusing on where you're going to be eating that night, it's not allowing you to focus on So insecurity in that way can distract you, but let's take it even a step further. Biologically, if you are malnourished, you are just, your, your, your nerves and synapses and everything in your brain is not working well and is not working right and is not working to its maximum potential. Also, what happens to you guys when you're hungry? Dude, you are sub s distracted, right? You are just sitting there. You're listening to me. I know you're not hungry now because you just ate all that pizza. But, but before, you were a little nervous that the pizza didn't get here. And you were going to have to sit here and listen to this. And you were hungry. And I was hungry too, right? You're distracted. And so you're not concentrating. But really, the biological need to be nourished is important. The freedom to the, the right to freedom of expression or opinion. Why do you need that for education? To actualize your right to education. You can say stupid things, I can say stupid things, and it's okay, right? Right to work. Why do you need the right to work in order to have the right to education? You guys probably more than anybody know that story, right? So even at the primary school level, someone's got to buy the pencils. Somebody's got to buy the school uniforms or the school fees, depending on where you are in school, what country, what the norms are, what the expectations are, right? So there's got to be some money operating somewhere. Finally, the right to adequate shelter. Why is that important? So somewhat related to this whole like insecurity that you don't know where you're going to sleep, right? And that definitely gives a burden to somebody. But it's hard to do your homework or to study in a car, right, or on a sidewalk. More than that, in this country until recently and still in some places, in order to register for school, you actually had to have an address. So if you didn't have an address, for to be enrolled in school, you could not enroll in public schools in this country. So organizations like the National Law Center for Homelessness and Poverty have worked hard to do that. So you see that all of these rights, and there are so many more of them, that go into just the right to education. And then from each one of these, there are a lot of spokes that come out as well. But what's like, in reality, one of our challenges in law school is to ensure that we don't talk about law or these kinds of norms in a vacuum, right? Because to implement it, you need to think about, you know, law just for law's sake. Some would argue is fine, but a lot of people would argue, you know, is just hollow. So, so how do you make this real? If you need all of those things to have the right to education, then, then how, do you, how, do you, how does a government make all of that happen all at the same time? Do they? They don't. And one of the things that they need to do is to balance rights. So you have a balancing of rights. Because not everybody can realize, you know, many countries have different kinds of resources, political choices and priorities are made by various governments. And so there is a balancing of rights that takes place. And that is true for almost every human rights issue that exists. Almost, not all, but almost. So how do rights become real? 
In international human rights law, we have this idea of progressive realization. Does anybody know what that is? So we progress towards realizing all of these rights, right? For all the human rights norms that are in the Universal Declaration or any of the nine human rights treaties that have been adopted by the United Nations that we generally call the, the major cadre of, of human rights law, um, uh, there is an expectation that you're not going to be able to ratify a treaty on a Tuesday and on Wednesday you will no longer have racial discrimination. Right? Not realistic to think that. It would be nice, but that's not going to happen. Right? Tuesday you ratify the treaty and suddenly no arbitrary detention. Everything is just fine. Right? There's one exception, though. One exception. Anybody want to guess? It's a, it's a, it's a set of standards and laws that uh, get a lot of play in this building because we have two of the world expert representatives dealing with those issues. Are we webcasting? Are we taping this? Torture. You may have heard that before. So, torture. Um, you, as you know, Dean Grossman is the chair of the UN Committee Against Torture, and Professor Juan Mendez is, is the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. They are the world's two leading authorities in the United Nations system um, fighting against torture. So the one exception to progressive realization is in the fight against torture. Because you cannot ratify a treaty on Tuesday and torture a little less on Wednesday and torture a little less on Thursday, right? You gotta stop right away. And that seems fair. That seems right. So you can see where some of the politics comes into all of this, right? We've got norms, we've got standards, we've got rights that we articulate, like right to you know, freedom from torture or the right to a fair trial or freedom of expression and those kinds of things. But in reality, we have to balance rights. We have to work towards their realization over time. And we have to ensure that they're implemented meaningfully. There are a variety of systems that exist to promote and to protect human rights. Anybody want to give me a sense? We just mentioned one a moment ago. It starts with a U. The United Nations. I'm going to take just the first two letters of it. So the United Nations represents the universal system of human rights. Sometimes they call that the international system, but in truth, there's the next one that I clicked the button already to. Right, which are regional systems. Those are also international, but they're regional in origin. So what are some examples of those? What are regional systems for the protection and promotion of human rights? No, what's the system itself? Those come next? So you're, you're getting, wait. There we go, the Inter-American uh, System for the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, the oldest regional system that exists in the world, the Inter-American System. What else? European, the European system. And then there's an African system as well. There's a nascent system being put in place in Asia, the ASEAN system, but it's really not up and functional at this point. There are national mechanisms, like an ombudsman's office or a national human rights institution. We do not have those mechanisms in this country, in the United States. There is no national human rights commission. There is no ombudsman's office. There are efforts underway to try to make that happen, but I can assure you, having been involved with them for a number of years, it's not happening, you shouldn't be looking for jobs with them at this point. It's still some time ahead. And then finally, local and domestic mechanisms. What's an example of a local and domestic mechanism for the promotion and protection of human rights? Can't hear. Union, so those are organizing groups 
terms of, I was thinking, those are great. I was thinking more formally in terms of like domestic courts or national courts, right? So even local courts, our center has an initiative to work together with legal aid attorneys in Texas and in Maryland and all across the country to bring human rights arguments at the, at the, the lowest level of courts day to day. Um, it's sort of a very breakthrough, very progressive orientation to human rights in this country. Um, and it's been interesting. Okay, so we skip through this because we've already talked about this. Every time I do this, I think I should take the slides out and I forget. So, briefly, the universal system. There are two dimensions to the universal system. And again, as we say universal, we mean the United Nations. The charter-based organs and the treaty-based organs of the United Nations. This gets confusing. This gets confusing pretty quickly. And a lot of people really don't understand that there is a difference between these two sides. So you, after the next five minutes, are gonna be so ahead of the game um, to begin to understand the differences. Charter-based, the United Nations Charter was signed in 1945, right, at the creation of the United Nations. It's like the Constitution of the United Nations. Right? It's based on a post-war desire to create an institution to promote security, fundamental human rights, and peace. And that is in the language of the Charter. There's a lot of human rights language in the Charter itself. It provides the operational structure and purpose for the UN, and it highlights this commitment to human rights and fundamental freedoms in the preamble and in its purposes. Here you go. Boom. The preamble to the UN Charter reaffirms faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the person, and in the equal rights of men and women of nations large and small. Great aspirational language. It's pretty awesome. 1945, just coming out of World War II, right? Horrific shadows behind the language that is here. So in the charter, it actually creates mechanisms that are tasked with some of this work around, around human rights stuff. There's the United Nations General Assembly, right? It's made up of all members of the United Nations, all states. Remember, these are all countries. So the people who sit there are all politicians and diplomats, diplomats being politicians, right? They're all bound to their governments. The Security Council, ah, it didn't, how many members, are, so there are 15 members of the Security Council, I can't ask that question, it's usually a question I ask. Five permanent members of the Security Council, all of whom have veto power, and 10 rotating members based on regional diversity. It's that body, the Security Council, that authorizes the use of force right, by the United Nations. It authorizes peacekeeping missions. It creates the mandates that govern the, the legal outlines of engagement, both in terms of war and in terms of peacekeeping, okay? So they play a very significant role, or sometimes they don't, because they won't take action. Um, you have the Economic and Social Council and then the UN Human Rights Council, which many of you may have heard about, we're gonna talk about in a few moments, and special procedures. These include special rapporteurs and independent experts. In this building, among our faculty, we have at least three current or former UN special rapporteurs and independent experts. Juan Mendez, as we, as we said before, is the current UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Um, Diane Orentlicker, who will be speaking at the event on, on Thursday about Northern Ireland and accountability, which I really encourage you all to come to, is the former UN independent expert um, uh, who rewrote the guiding principles on fighting impunity. Okay, lots of war crime stuff. And then um, uh, Professor Bob Goldman is the former and was the first independent expert of the United Nations on human rights and terrorism. All of them have played very important roles. Um, so the UN Human Rights Council, 
We hear a lot about this, right? And people really confuse this into some of these treaty bodies that we're going to talk about in a second. But the UN Human Rights Council, there are good things, there are bad things, and there are really ugly things that have gone on in this council. It replaced the very highly politicized Commission on Human Rights in 2006. Highly politicized because the representatives who sit on the council are countries. And the countries who sit on the council are represented by political interests. So as much as the council is supposed to be a charter-based mechanism that will non-politically look at human rights issues, the truth of the matter is it's a highly, highly political body. It was crazy political under the commission. They put in place certain safeguards to try to make it a little bit less political, but it still is pretty political even now. There's a regional distribution of seats, as is the case with every UN organ, so that it's divided out with representation from around the world. 13 African countries, 13 Asian countries, six from Eastern Europe, eight from Latin America, and the Caribbean, seven from Western Europe and other. When they redid the commission and turned it into the council, they moved it up in its bureaucratic standing within the UN so that it now sits under the General Assembly, which is like the Congress, kind of, right? It's like the highest elected body in the UN. Um, and no longer are you elected by your block of countries. You are now elected directly by all of the members of the General Assembly. But the politics persists, right? The piece of this that I actually think is the redeeming quality of the UN Human Rights Council is the Universal Periodic Review Process, the UPR. All member states of the United Nations, everybody, not just the council members, are subject to review of their human rights status every four years. There are 48 countries reviewed every year. So largely they get through it all. They've been through one round of reviews. Everyone's been reviewed. It's led by a troika of three countries of members of the council. And each country, no matter which treaties they have ratified or treaties they have not ratified, are assessed on the basis of the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration, the treaties to which a state is a party, voluntary pledges and commitments, like, you know, saying we're going to do this, um, and relevant international humanitarian law. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights puts together a stakeholder document, which is actually really good, because it kind of brings together all of the information from various treaty bodies and other assessments that have been done of the country. And then there are opportunities for civil society to also submit information about it. So everyone gets reviewed. But again, they're reviewed by the representatives of various states. So it can be a very political process. The last thing that I want to talk about, there's lots more, but we're running late and I want to have some time for some questions, are treaty-based me mechanisms. So these treaties, these human rights treaties, emerge from this horizontal agreement of sovereign nations. There are nine core human rights treaties which have emerged from this universal declaration that was adopted in 1948. Just quickly, the UDHR links rights and responsibilities was adopted on December 10, 1948. It was the intention to create one giant human rights treaty, obligating everybody to everything, right? But some things got in the way in 1948. Any guess? What got in the way of a big human rights treaty? The Cold War, good, exactly. Uh, well, there's a slide later that says the Cold War, politics, politics, politics. But, but that is exactly right, because there was a split between political orientations, right, of the Soviet bloc, which really liked economic and social issues. Everyone should have a house, everybody should have a job, everybody should have health care, and we're going to provide that for you. Might not be great, but we're going to provide that for you. 
The West really liked civil and political rights, like you have right to due process, you have freedom of expression, um, um, you know, you have the right to vote in an unrigged election, right? And there was a clash of these orientations. And so that split up what was in the Universal Declaration and what came out of the Universal Declaration. When you look at the UDHR, and again, I encourage you to take a, a copy of it outside, you see that it starts from this article that we read, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, a right to equality. And then it goes to the flip side. Flip side of the right to equality, in my view, is the freedom from discrimination. Then it goes through a whole range of civil and political rights, like those ones I just outlined for you. Right to vote, right to stand for election, uh, right to due process, right to a fair trial, that kind of stuff. Articles 22 to 29, economic, social, and cultural rights. The right to education, the right to work, the right to housing, the right to adequate shelter, actually, is the right to housing. So making it real, politics, politics, politics. We split them out. We have the UDHR, and it's split into these two giant covenants. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So there are but these nine core human rights treaties. Normally I would ask you, but I'm just going to tell you that the one treaty that many of you will think about and is the first major human rights treaty that was adopted by the United Nations is not on the list of key UN human rights treaties. I am going to ask you which one it is. So we've got those two huge covenants, right, on civil, political, and, and uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. And then we've got these seven other treaties racial discrimination, discrimination against women, torture, rights of the child, protection of migrant workers, people with disabilities, enforced disappearances, whoops. The number uh, in red with SP are the number of states parties. These are the number of countries that have ratified these treaties. What do we think of as a major human rights treaty that's not there. Anybody? What's not there? Rwanda, the Holocaust. Bosnia, what? I'm here. Geneva Convention, so the Geneva Conventions are, that's a good guess, are the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law. That's true, those are not there. I'm thinking of something else. Genocide Convention, correct. So the Genocide Convention is not there. The Genocide Convention was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly 10 days before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So technically it's the first human rights treaty adopted by the United Nations. Beautifully symbolic, right? That that, that would be the first thing that was adopted um, after the Holocaust, driven largely by a guy named Raphael Lemkin, who coined the phrase Holocaust it had not existed before he coined it. Um, I'm mean, sorry, the word genocide, excuse me. Um, it did not exist before he invented it. Um, and he really pushed for this treaty to exist. He lost his whole family in Poland. So the genocide convention's not there. Any reason why? It's a technical issue. Each of these committees is overseen by a committee of experts. Each of these treaties has a committee of experts elected in individual non-political capacities with regional distribution so that you get people from all over the world, but in their own professional 
um, uh, in their own professional capacity as experts in the field of human rights. And they are elected for periods of time to sit on these committees to oversee the implementation of these treaties. The Genocide Convention does not have one of these committees. All of these other treaties do. And so we don't put the Genocide Convention here um, in this list. There, are some, there is some degree of repercussion to completely failing to implement any pieces of these treaties because you are, you, the state party, is reviewed by these committees usually every four years. You submit a report to the committee. They translate it into the UN languages. It's circulated among these members. And you have a, a sit down, stand up, throw down with the members of these committees, usually in Geneva, because most of them meet in Geneva, um, where members of the, the, the state will have the opportunity to make a statement that will talk about their report and all of the great efforts that the state has made to implement these treaties, racial discrimination, women, whatever issue it happens to be, whichever treaty it happens to be. And then the members of the committee will grill them or not grill them because there's still some degree of political overlay, um, and ask them about implementation. Ask them about how they have moved towards realizing all of these rights. Ask them specific questions about legal frameworks, about implementation, political priorities, individual cases that are brought to the attention of the committee members. And in the end, after a, an afternoon and a morning process, it's split over two days, the committee will then issue concluding observations, basically recommendations as to how the state could or should better improve its implementation of the treaty. It gives guidance on things for them to concentrate on for the next four years. Okay? Some of these committees have optional protocols that have to be ratified separately so that there is an individual petition possibility for people whose rights have been violated if they exhaust their domestic remedies, a phrase that you will all become familiar with if you're not already. Um, they can actually appeal to these treaty monitoring bodies and they will investigate them. But it is a process and it is a long process. So the Genocide Convention doesn't have those mechanisms and it's the closest thing that we have to some sort of enforcement tool for the implementation, pushing the implementation of these treaties. The video laid out some of the critiques around the international human rights system. You will have more, you will hear more, and you will learn more as you move forward in your study and in your interest of international human rights. This was only a small, small taste. Right? We've got like 20 more slides, a whole semester, three years of law school, and a lifetime of learning. But it gives you a little bit of taste of some of the things that we talk about, some of the phrases that you will hear thrown about, and some of the challenges in terms of some of these structural elements of how the international human rights system is constructed. You get to take away the fact that all rights are interrelated and there's a difference between charter-based and treaty-based mechanisms. If you take those two things away, you did well today. At this point, I want to stop to give us a few moments for questions and to encourage you that if you are interested, if you are, are, uh, want to learn more, there is so much available, not just in this building, but in this town. And I hope that you all will take advantage of it. Our next big thing is uh, Human Rights Boot Camp, which will take place on Saturday the 20th. I encourage you to sign up for it. I also really encourage any of you who can to join us on Friday afternoon, the 20th of September, to visit the Holocaust Museum. We start the year every year by organizing this visit down to the Holocaust Museum. If you have not been there, if you have not heard about what is there, if you have not had the experience of um, talking with people, of talking with a survivor of the Holocaust, and then hearing about efforts now being made on the cutting edge to try to prevent genocide from happening, you really should come with us. 
Um, it's free. It's open to everybody. You need to send an email to the center to sign up for it. But we really, it, I find it to be one of the most impactful things that we do every year. So I hope you will join us. There's lots to learn. There's lots to do. And, and I'm so glad that all of you came today to get this little taste for the beginning. Thank you guys for coming. Also, just one more thing to know, this is a monthly series that we have as this introductory piece. Professor Rick Wilson will pick up in October where I left off today and will dig down deeper around this split between civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. He's great, so I would encourage you to come. And then I think the third one um, in November will be about those Geneva Conventions. It will be a little bit about international humanitarian law and international criminal law. And we hope that Professor Diane Orntlicker will do it, but don't quote me on it. Don't go to her and say that you've already heard that she's going to do it because I'm not sure that we've confirmed with her yet. Okay, any questions or comments or thoughts? I know we're running a little bit late. Sir. You can detain people without torturing them. You can detain people without waterboarding them. Okay, bad example. Um, because, you know, on Tuesday, uh, this horrible dictatorship was really not to, you know, um, flog people, but then there's, there's no waterboarding people. And then, they're violating the treaty? They're, they're vi I mean, you know, yeah, they're doing, I mean, is there less bad torture? I'm not sure that there's less bad torture, right? So, I mean, there, there, there is bad behavior, and the treaty, actually, the Torture Convention, is the Convention on Torture and Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Treatment and Punishment. It's really long. It's a long title. It's not a long treaty, but it's a very long title. Um, and so it envisions not just torture, which is kind of the most extreme example, but also cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment and punishment. That could be prison conditions. That could be conditions of detention. Um, um, you know, that, that is a whole range of, uh, of actions and conditions that the state imposes on an individual when they're in custodial care. So, but it could be something even like the way that a child is treated in uh, a, an institution, an orphanage that's run by the state. It could be the way in which a child, there was something on NPR, a friend of mine's producer for NPR, they had this thing about how children are often kept in isolation in Ohio because of behavioral issues, right? Well, we know that solitary confinement in any way for adults is a horrific, and very damaging experience. The Special Rapporteur actually released a report about a year ago um, on solitary confinement and the ways in which it constitutes torture. Doing that to children is even worse because children tolerate, children's tolerance of being in solitary confinement um, is, is much shorter, lower, shorter. You know what I mean. You know what I mean? So there's a whole continuum but things that would constitute torture itself under the definition of torture need to be stopped immediately. Ideally, all of it does, but... What about, like, maybe at, at a federal level, this horrible dictatorship would stop the torture, but provincial agents might continue to continue? So this country actually, like, not with the torture argument, but with the implementation of these treaties, the whole federalism argument is a really big one for the U.S. government. Right, because we've got a big federal country. Brazil likes it too. Mexico likes it too. Like, you know, anybody with a federal system. Look, we can't control what those guys do in Texas. Like, we would like it not to happen too. But you know, but you know what? Article six of the U.S. Constitution says that treaties are the supreme law of the land. You know, like we gotta like it's the Constitution. So there's an obligation. There's an obligation to implement these things. There's an obligation to ensure that it rolls into the states. Some states actually in this country, again, I'm using this country as an example, but some states um, 
there are movements to adopt these treaties on a state level as well. Now, legally, technically, do you need to do that? No, technically, legally, no. But to get them implemented, maybe. You know, the city and county of San Francisco, where I'm from, so I'm very proud, um, adopted CEDAW in the city and county of San Francisco, the Women's Human Rights Convention. But not only did they adopt it, they put money where their mouth was. They created a department of the status of women. At first it was a commission, then they created a city department with a budget that looks at gender responsive budgeting, how CDOT is implemented through all city and county policies and programs, and, and you know, they, they're serious about it. It's a great model. It's not uncomplicated. And there has to be political will to want to do it. So, which is true for everything. Anything else? You guys are the, the hardy, stalwart people. You get extra credit points. Except for those of you in my class, which I'm not giving you extra credit points, sorry. Yeah. they intervene in Libya because there was oil. Why, you know, I mean, okay, so I'm giving you a little maybe political agenda here, but, but, but there are political interests that are involved. You have five permanent members of the UN Security Council. If any of them veto, and any of them can, and that's Russia, China, the United States, and we go from there. So just those three, right, don't agree on very much. Um, uh, they have to authorize the use of force. They have to all agree on the use of force. Rarely do they. So, so that's on one hand. On the other hand, the Genocide Convention is very interesting because while there's no committee that backs it up and there's certainly no boots on the ground enforcement army, right? We don't have a human rights army, which might be a good thing, might be a bad thing. I don't know. We can go from there. But, um, Technically, under the Genocide Convention, if you call something a genocide, you are legally obligated to intervene, to stop it, okay? Nothing has ever been called a genocide, right? Cambodia wasn't called a genocide. State Department, there, there is a, a, a just, hor just, just kind of mind-boggling footage from a State Department spokesperson's uh, news conference during the, gen the 100 days of the genocide in Rwanda where she said that genocidal acts were being committed. The reporter said, what's a genocidal act? Like, what's the difference between a genocidal act and a genocide? And, you know, in Rwanda, like, you could see it coming. It was so clear that this was a genocide. While it was happening, it was so clear that it was a genocide. Um, and she wouldn't budge on it because her speaking points where you don't say genocide. You can say genocidal acts, but you don't say genocide. 
Colin Powell, on the other hand, testified to Congress and said that a genocide was taking place in Darfur, but no action was taken. In this room, we had, in 2006, 2005, we had huge conferences with overflow rooms, all major actors around what was going on in Darfur at the time. And when he made that statement about genocide in Darfur, we all thought, that's it, somebody's going to finally do something. This is all, like, we see it on satellite imaging, that there's scorched earth policies and that hundreds and thousands of people are being displaced and killed. On the basis of their ethnicity, nothing happened. So, it's it is a it, it, the the whole world of human rights is a difficult, and challenging, and sometimes very very depressing, um, world of actually actualizing a lot of these kinds of rights. But I like to say, because I'm not going to leave you on a down note, um, and I truly deeply believe that human rights attorneys are the most optimistic people in the world. We believe that the world can be better, and we believe that we can make it that way. And we can. But there are complicated forces at work, and you need to understand them. And one of my messages for students all the time here um, is, like, human rights is, is a very romantic idea. And sometimes people really get sucked into the romance of it all. I want to be a human rights attorney. I'm like, do you know what it means to be a human rights attorney? You sit in a conference room, the same conference room in a lot of different countries. And believe me, the conference room looks exactly the same everywhere. The quality of the coffee might be a little bit different. The accents might be a little bit different. And sometimes they're not even. Um, and you're hitting your head against the wall. Then you hit the other side of your head against the wall. Then you hit your forehead against the wall. And then suddenly you have a little breakthrough, and you're so excited and you celebrate those breakthroughs. Because sometimes those breakthroughs save lives. And then we come back and we tell you guys these stories, and it all sounds really romantic and great, but it's a conference room, and then we go back to hitting our head against the wall again. We keep doing it because we really believe that this world can be a better place with that fundamental belief in all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And so that's where the challenge is for all of us in figuring out how to make that work. Whether you're a human rights attorney, whether you're a tax attorney, whether you're in-house counsel someplace, or whether you like start a new pizza parlor because that's what you do when you get out of law school. But we have roles to play, each one of us in that. So, so there you go. That's my, that's, my, that's my total soapbox on the whole genocide thing. I get very upset about it. So. That's it. Anything else? Thank you all for staying. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the Syria event, Thursday at the Northern Ireland event, next week at the Holocaust Museum, and then at boot camp on Saturday. We're good. That's the next two weeks. We'll let you know what we're doing after that, too. Thank you all.